Thank you so much for joining us for um, our very first session at the Members Lounge 2022. We're so excited to have everyone here. Welcome to Far Away Worlds, Picture Editing, Sound, and VFX in Horror and Genre, presented by the Directors Guild of Canada in Ontario at the 2022 Members Lounge. My name is Katie Elder, and I am the Senior Manager of Programming and Membership at the Canadian Academy. Members Lounge 2022 is presented by the Canadian Media Producers Association, which represents hundreds of thousands, sorry, hundreds of Canadi Canada's independent producers. They are the people who make the shows and movies that you love. Members Lounge 2022 is also made possible with the support of our programming partners, Directors Guild of Canada and Ontario, William F. White International, Bell Fund, Le Fond Bell, Boat Rocker, Nabet 700M Unifor, Telefilm Canada, La Banque Nationale, the Bureau du Cinéma et de la Télévision du Québec, the Independent Production Fund, Panavision, and La Sodec. If you have any questions for today's speakers, please put them in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, and we'll save some time for those at the end of today's session. And with no further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel. First, we have Deshen Naidu. Born and raised in Yellowknife, Deshen uh, works with Sound Dogs in Toronto as a sound designer with credits on projects such as The Strain, The Expanse, The Shape of Water, and most recently, Nightmare Alley and Firestarter. Hello, welcome. Uh, Dev Singh is an editor for movies and television who has worked with various directors, showrunners, cinematographers, sound teams, designers, and producers, many of whom he feels fortunate to call friends and creative collaborators. And finally, we have Kristen Patterson. Kristen has honed her skills in VFX and virtual production at Pixamondo in both LA and Canada, working on blockbusters such as Ant-Man and Captain America Civil War, as well as Star Trek Discovery, Westworld, and The Mandalorian. And I will pass it off to our moderator for today's session, Carolyn Morissette. Carolyn is a critic, programmer, and development coordinator for the Blood in the Snow Film Festival and director of Canadian programming for the Fantasia International Film Festival. She's contributed to several film encyclopedias and has produced talks on a range of topics, including Afrofuturism and Black in Monstrous Roles. Thank you so much, everyone, and welcome. Thanks so much, Katie. I'm very excited, <clears throat> very, very excited to get to going on this talk. Um, so I think a lot of people, you know, when you see genre film, um, you kind of assume like, yes, okay, we've got effects, we've got sound, um, we've got the editing, but um, I just wanted to know from each of you, like uh, collaborating with the director, um, how is that, like, how does that process go for you? Um, and let's start with Dash. Oh, sure. Yeah. So for me, I usually jump on somewhere in the picture edit. Um, if we're talking about feature films, um, I'll us usually where it starts for me is I'll either get an email from the picture assistant or the picture editor themselves and saying, can we grab a, a whole bunch of sound effects that you could folder for us or organize for us that we can pull from to just help smooth out the audio and the scenes. And that, you know, naturally transitions to, okay, now that we have this stuff, could you just take this whole scene that we're working on and flesh it out sonically and, you know, add all the bells, whistles and ambiences and everything so we can kind of see it a little more fleshed out. And then that turns into creative conversations as, as you start to deliver that, as I start to deliver that stuff into the Avid, it inspires the, the sound creative conversations where I get to talk to you know, Dev, the picture editor, and who then ropes me in with the director. And, you know, COVID aside, we all sit in a room together, hopefully, and we can watch through things. And what we call a spotting session, which is uh, a creative conversation between myself, uh, the picture editor, director, producer, um, music uh, supervisors sometimes show up, composers sometimes show up, and we all sit at a big round table together and we watch uh, the film or show, and we start to have a creative conversation about how it's all going to work together sonically with picture, you know, what's the sort of goal here when it comes to sound, where does sound design live, uh, what needs to be re-recorded, which actors need to be brought in right away, and all of these things sort of 
um, get ironed out from that position. So from that point, whether it's a director or a showrunner, that's sort of my end to that line of communication. And, you know, I'm always for it because I love creating that conduit right away. The quicker I can create that conduit, the, the, the easier it is for me to create stuff more accurately and to put stuff in the Avid that's accurate or at the very least start versions of things that we can work on. Right. And I think, I guess, Dev, for you, I mean, you're creating um, like a, I guess, different versions of the film, I would imagine, or show um, so that you can present to the, you know, the director, everybody involved. Um, so I guess taking into what Dash has said, like, and, and, and collaborating that way, um, like how often, like how many edits do you usually, are you do you get, are you given that space to give like the best edit possible, obviously, but like how many do you have to narrow it down to? Uh, well, you know, sort of from the beginning, I think jumping on what Dash was saying, mm -hmm. um, a lot of it is just the communication, like in a, like say on sort of a little bit medium or larger features, and and even indie stuff too. You're you're generally trying to just keep up with cameras. So every day that you get dailies, you're like working through the dailies. You're having communications with the director. You know, on say Resident Evil, when he would go on set, I, we would talk uh, video calls and stuff. And then he would sort of download a little bit of what he was doing the day before. We'd get our dailies. I'd start working through all that stuff. Uh, if he had some, if, if a director has some concerns or they're shooting something in that same day, I'll start to put that stuff together pretty quickly and then I'll show it to him in different variations, like this, depending on how fast we have to do it. So a lot of times I'll put, I'll start to put sound, some music, you sort of get a scene to sort of see how it's playing initially. And, and then I'll send it to the director right away, like the same day he'll, they'll take a look at it, the director will take a look at it, and then we'll usually then have another conversation. There might be some notes, a little bit of back and forth. And that's, so for say Resident Evil, that was like 10 weeks during the shoot, every daily. You just sort of send stuff, take a look at things. I'd have conversations with with uh, our version of Kristen uh, there, <laughs> you know, like a uh, visual effects supervisor, visual effects producer. And, and like Dash was saying, you want to have communication as early as possible with, with the entire group. And the larger scale the, the film or show, the more communication you want to have. The, as much communication as possible, as, as is allowed, I guess. Because that, that keeps it moving and you get to throw out ideas and you get to ask questions. And anyone that has a question of me as we're, we're coming up, I just would go to the director and the producer and say, can I send this to the visual effects department? Yes. So, and then, and that dialogue that we have with all different departments uh, really gets everybody on the same page. It's why you get storyboards of complex sequences. You know, I like to put that together, put a little sound to it, start piecing that together. So, I mean, communication with the director is preeminent. We're all there trying to get that as we go. And, you know, as I'm, I'm fortunate, in that uh, I get to be one of those first people in there. Uh, and then I get to work with the director, usually just them and me for a little while, which is which is really fun. You get inside their vision. We're all there servicing the director's vision. So the communication that I can translate to say Dash to Kristen, Kristen can communicate something to me at the week, at the end of the week, like we're really gonna need this. This is like a big section. We've been designing this for months already, you know, anything you can show me, that would be great. You know, so if we have complex, say in Resident Evil, we had a scene with a liquor and that had a green suit. It was a key figure from the game. It was a fight sequence. It was choreographed, it was stunted. Uh, you know, we had all these, you know, the pace and the layout of it was a certain way. You'd want to get that fast so that you can see things, everything that, can I hold this shot longer? Because that'll give someone like Dash an opportunity to, to drop like, you know, or a creak that comes from somewhere. That can add this sense of tension. You know, how long do we open up the jaw? Cause there's gonna be something happening. And, you know, we might have conversations as we go, like, 
we have this design that the visual effects team will have. And then we'll go, you know what's interesting is if we hold that and we get a little saliva between the teeth, that'd be cool. Then the visual effects department will go, oh, that's a great idea. Here, well, let's use this and then this. And then Dash will come up with something else. And I think that that, that communication between all of us help service the director and get closer to their vision earlier. And the earlier that we can do that, the more play that we can have, the more that we can experiment. Anyway, that was long. No, that's amazing because I was, as you mentioned storyboard, I was gonna ask uh, Kristen, like you would think um, with the, um, the VFX, you would come in later in the game, but I would imagine you're right there at the beginning too, because directors need to, like they have an idea, you have to translate that into actual <laughs> digital effects. So I would imagine you'd come in the same time, right? Um, it really depends on the production. Um, I was gonna talk a little bit about, so for traditional VFX, we do come on quite early for concept work and like tests and uh, things of that nature. But uh, for more recent productions we've been involved in, we've been sort of, Pixamano has been pioneering something called virtual production, which is um, the show decides to shoot at least part of their content on an LED wall. This was like something that the Mandalorian kind of popularized. Um, and then in that case, we are building the environments from the earliest days of pre-production. Um, and then those are being shot in camera on the LED wall. So in those cases, we're involved even earlier than editorial because we are kind of um, concepting the way that everything is going to look, building it out and then testing it on the wall, which is like the, the LED stage that they're going to shoot on. Um, and for traditional VFX, we do come on early to do concept work, to do um, range of motion tests on big characters, stuff like that. We are communicating often with editorial. Um, they often do temps that we are trying to match closely on our side, but of course, adding in like the realism that you would see from like a finished shot. So we go through a number of passes with editorial, like first draft animation passes, um, map painting work, all of that kind of thing, all the way down to the final final comps are delivered. Actually, that that actually kind of brings me to my next um, question because you that's a show that's a streaming show, obviously. Um, and it's beautiful, The Mandalorian. I totally hooked <laughs> um, <laughs> down to like the closing credits with the beautiful artwork. Like that's incredible. So um, my question leading to basically um, television and streaming versus um, like big screen theater films, like I don't think that would change the detail really, but is there like a slight adjustment that you need to make for that sort of thing? Kristen, I guess I'll start again. Will you start with you? Yeah, it really depends on the production. Sometimes we get a lot of time to, to work through what everything is going to look like. But the main difference I would say between television and film is the timeline. Um, for episodics, it's much faster generally because you're delivering however many eight to 12 episodes often like back to back. <laughs> so trying to finish the first episode while also working on future episodes can be kind of um, tighter timelines than, than something like a feature film where you're working on all of the shots from the very beginning. And um, Dash, the same question for you, I guess is, is it's pretty much similar, the timeline for you? Yeah, yeah, I think I, um, uh, Kristen nailed it. I think we all we all sort of go, that's the commonality is that it's just time, um, but we certainly compensate for it because when I go into a TV series, I mean, I do this with films as well, but I'll try to get scripts as early as possible because a script will give me an idea if there's like a vintage car or if there's something practical that they have on set that we need to record. And I can do that months ahead of time. It means that I get a jump on not having to scramble in the last minute to go out and record that stuff. And there's a lot of logistics that go into recording some of this stuff too. So I really compensate on TV because like sound editorial wise we on average we get like two to three weeks an episode and you know 
it can range from sci-fi all the way to action, all the way to drama, and you kind of got to be ready for all of it. Um, so all of your work has to fit inside of a two to three week schedule, um, which can be a lot of heavy lifting. So the more you organize yourself at the beginning, the more you're sort of giving yourself proper time to cut. But also at the same time, what becomes more important to me is that I have fun doing it. And I don't want to lose sight of that either, is that if I can prepare myself ahead of time for a tight deadline, then I can enjoy the process regardless of how much time I have on a show. Yeah. Um, I actually, this is just an aside for you, Dash, but I, do you walk around with like a digital <laughs> recorder or do you like pick up sounds if you're out and about? Like, is that... You know, it's funny. I'm, I'm the one thing I don't do anymore is I, I, I never listen to music when I walk around outside. I, I, I'm really aware of the environments and I'm aware of doors and cars and how things in the real world sound because it's all sort of, it, it all applies. Um, so I tried to really focus on that stuff. So if there is something interesting, I'll run home, grab a recorder, or I'll set up a time to go record it. But, mm -hmm. you know, aside from that, I'm just really aware of, of my surroundings. Oh, yeah, that's so cool. I don't know. I just, I've always, you know, thought about sound like that, because genre film relies so much on the sound. And, and, you know, that the, as um, Dev was saying, you know, he's watching something and then, oh, this sound, you know, this might help dash and you pull in that sound like it just makes a scene sometimes because as a person who watches like genre film basically every day <laughs> for what I do um it, it, you do notice these things and I, one of my uh, pet peeves I'm, I'm always saying this on panels and <laughs> other things is that you know when you're a filmmaker just please spend the money on on the sound because that'll even if you've got a you know great looking film you need that sound to kind of pull everything together otherwise people are like what what's going on I can't hear the dialogue I can't hear the effect so yeah I that's I don't know I've, I've always been fascinated with sound design it's um, interesting too sorry I won't take oh, too much go time, ahead no go I ahead just, I just wanted to piggyback on what you were saying because it's also great is that if we do our job right it's like we never did our job at all which is sort of the irony of it and and that's like you know you think of a of any science fiction show like Mandalorian like our job is to make you believe that spaceship is that spaceship, you know, the same way Kristen works to achieve that, the same way Dev works to achieve that. And, you know, even though we're all in different departments, there's so much connective tissue between us. Even when we're not talking, we're all working towards the same goal, almost at the same pace at a certain point, but it's all to make it believable. So yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing because it, the less somebody says about the sound of a, of a show too, sometimes it's a compliment in a weird way, right? Yeah, oh, for sure. And it's so great that you said pace dash because I was going to talk to Dev about pacing and editing and like catching the rhythm. I mean, because you're also in a way directing the film yourself. You're trying to pull that best performance and collaborating with the director and, and, and you know, um, like, I don't know, I've always, there's a movie, uh, Baby Driver, for instance, and that film was like, you had to be right on the ball with the sound, with the editing, with the effects. So, um, like, in terms of pacing, how do you do it? <laughs> I guess I'm just going to ask you the simple question, like, because it is a, a sense of rhythm, right? Yeah, there's a musicality to editing, for sure. You know, you kind of, and and it's interesting a lot of times like as i'm going through the process i'll i'll sort of turn off the picture and just listen to it so you know there's a cadence to how people speak and uh and you can imagine the pictures and you can kind of see cuts in your head when you hear dialogue and and then i'll do the same thing you know sort of midway through the process or later in the process with sound i'll turn it off and i'll just watch the picture and as you kind of watch the picture, you can kind of see some depth to it. You can see the depth of sound and the de depth in the image. And so, and, and then you can, I mean, pacing is, you know, genre stuff is really fun for rhythm and pacing because uh, you kind of want to play against it. So, you know, if people are sort of accustomed to like a four, four time, you know, and you go on beat, you want to go maybe a little earlier, a little bit late or hide something in the image. And if you hide something, you can use sound to kind of play with it. And, and that's, you know, you, you have visual effects that, that do that too, like darkening the side. You might sort of look at this and put it in shadow. There's, there's just, there's so much fun. Like 
and a, and an example of that is like we had a shot where it sort of goes over a city and then and then sort of comes down from a a sign into a motel and it's sort of the the start of a film proper like there was a prologue and that came in so the city was actually designed by visual effects it was a shot that we borrowed we were kind of thinking of something they they developed that whole thing. We had rain that came in. That was all coming from visual effects. There was some on set. We enhanced it because we wanted to see that feeling. I put rain on there. You know, I you know you're sort of doing it, and then sent it to Sound Dogs. And we were kind of playing around, and you know, I remember getting rain from Dash, and I would be like, man, this rain is phenomenal. It's like very slappy. And it was like early stages. So that adjusted my cut. I opened it up a little bit because that would draw some more tension. This rain sounded so great. And then, you know, then there was like little electrical, you know, you could start to see like a light flash on and off. So there'd be an electrical sound. So that holds your attention. So this, this, this real collaboration in the beginning without the visual effects sort of filling in the rain, you probably cut that shot off. But then visual effects add some extra time to it. So now you can spend a little bit more time with the shot. And that adds to a certain level of tension. You don't know what's going to happen next. And that feel is a great, is a lot of fun to play with. And, and you know, if I'm giving anything away for this thing, it's just how collaborative this whole thing is. Like, we all play with each other. And that's actually the most fun of doing it, whether it's streaming, whether it's Features are a little bit more fun because, again, we're all talking about time. We have more time to talk. We have more time to go through ideas. Uh, streaming, TV, it's fast. So what you miss is the conversation. You're still doing the work. You just feel like your, your conversations are quicker. You know, you're like, you don't get as much time to sort of go down a rabbit hole of an idea and pulling back out. You kind of have to, you have to commit a little earlier. Um, and, and that's a little different. It's fun to committing to that and putting yourself there. But, uh, I think it's just that part, that rhythm is, is a collaborative effort and it's, and it's a blast. It's like the most fun of the whole process. I love that you all like love your job so much and you have fun with it. And I think that's, I think that for me, because you always hear people, oh, you know, you, you listen to interviews of directors, oh, it's coming down to the wire and like, you know, someone was having a nervous breakdown on set and whatever, but really um, you get to do the thing that you love, which I, I really, um, I really admire that because I mean, I love watching any kind of film like that, you know, and I love the fact that I get to do my job was, is part of, part of my job is watching film. So it just makes me really happy to hear that you love doing it so much. And actually on that tip, um, maybe talk about a little bit how each of you got into your jobs, because I know that's kind of a basic question, but um, I think a lot of jobs lead to other jobs. So maybe Kristen, did you want to start off with that? Sure. Yeah. I uh, was a double major in film and journalism when I was in college. Um, and then I got a job at a visual effects house in Los Angeles uh, at as a like camera um, technician and um, vault person, which is like, we basically organized all of the media that the everyone had worked on and the house I worked for did a lot of commercial work. All that stuff needed to be delivered on um, hard copies at the time. Um, so I worked there, I transitioned into production um, and I loved it. So I kept working in that space and moved to a different company. And then that company, which I work for now, Pixamondo, um, asked me to come to the Toronto office for a six month gig for Fast and Furious. Um, and I ended up staying because I loved it so much. <laughs> So I'm still here. <laughs> awesome. Um, uh, Dev, how did you get into your job? Uh, similarly, I went to uh, I went to university. I actually went for a, a sciences degree, a BSc, uh, and I started that. I finished that degree, and I sort of wandered for a little bit, and I worked, and. Uh, 
and that was like fun. I kind of had uh, like an early twenties crisis rather than like a midlife crisis. And so then I went back to film school, I applied and I got into Ryerson and my last name is Singh. I think I wanted to be kind of a direct, a writer director at that time. Um, and, uh, and I'd heard, I think I'd read somewhere that editing made you a better director. A lot of, a lot of great, uh, uh, directors had started as editors. So my last name is Singh. As we went around in the first days or so of film school, everybody said what they wanted to do and they were all writer, director, writer, director, writer, director. So by the time it got to the S's and me, I was kind of probably being a little spiteful and said, oh, editing. And then of course I ended up doing everybody's films at school for like four years. Uh, and it, and it suited me. Like it was just a, it's a part of the, the area that I like the most, you tell stories, you're kind of with it, you drive a little bit because you're on the on the computer, you know, and uh, and I get to sort of feel performance, feel the story right away in character and and I get to have a little bit of a perspective and I kind of get to be the first audience of a movie and you know, all those things are really thrilling and then and then I get to work with talented people in, in all departments. And that's a lot of fun. Like learning from everybody is great. Uh, you know, I learned so much each job with directors, with visual effects, supervisors and producers with, I actually did visual effects at Mr. X for a little bit too. So I have, you know, I have a fondness in my heart for, for visual effects and the work that's involved in it and the size and scale of the team. And then sound. I mean, one of my favorite things is being on a mix stage. It's like, it's a group. You're you're a band all together. There's five, six of you, the mixers, the and you're you're sharing ideas. You walk over, you whisper in somebody's ear, like, what about this? And then I get to go down, they change something, I go down into the edit suite, I open it up a little bit here. There's some more opportunity for this. And so, you know, it's like you I get to be like a bass player or a drummer in a band. It's amazing, you know. That's or nowadays, awesome. like the producer. <laughs> yeah. You know? <laughs> Nowadays, I call myself a producer because it's a little bit more. I get more technology to play with. <laughs> That's awesome. And <laughs> and Dash, how about yourself? Um, yeah, so I after high school, I went to the University of Alberta and I I did like a couple film studies course there or one film studies course. And it was interesting because and kind of ironic because they, they kind of sit you in a dark room and you watch silent films for like you know, nine hours, but it was like fascinating to me. I think some people find that's so fascinating to me. Um, and so from there, I just wanted to get into the practical side of, of filmmaking. So I applied to Sheridan College. Um, and again, like Dev was saying, everybody, like including myself, writer, director, it's just like, you, you don't really know the the branches that it reaches out to you. You're just excited to, to you know, get to that level. Um, and I took a, a sound for film course and it just was like the perfect block that fit the perfect piece of the puzzle in my brain. And it just, I just latched onto it. It just made perfect sense for me. Um, and yeah, it just, it was just a big light bulb that went off. And then after I, I focused on that for three years of film school, I just ran directly at Sound for Film. And I was fortunate enough to have a professor that worked in the industry and was working at the industry and works for Sound Dogs. Um, and through that connection, I was able to get into the doors of Sound Dogs, and I just worked my way from, you know, intern all the way up to sound designer um, over 15, 16 years. Um, so I'm, yeah. And yeah, for the same reasons Dev said, like, it, it's so awesome. Like, my favorite part of, of working on, especially films, because there's such a longer process to it, is sitting in a mix room with everyone and watching how, you know, Kristen's work, matches Dev's work, matches my work. And even though there were broken bits of communication at time, we all came together to create this and it's all seamless and it, you know, and it's really satisfying. I think more than anything, that's the biggest reward is watching how all of our work comes together for one idea that just works. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really amazing because, um, you know, when you see you, everyone sees the end product but, um, you know, and I, I'm one of those people that stays for the end credits because it's important because there are people who, as you're saying, come together to create that one film, that one product. And they all need their kind of moment, like if you just see their names, you know, once during those credits. But 
I, I think I, I, I really appreciate that all the work that you, um, each one of you um, creates to, to make that one product. It's, it's, you know, it really, you really do create magic. You really take, you know, pull something out of that uh, stratosphere and throw it into a film and it works. So I, I think that's really amazing. Um, and I know Dash, you had uh, mentioned about like different like aesthetics from show to show and um, film to film. So could you talk about that a little bit more, like just changing that up? Oh yeah, and you know, the only reason I thought about that is because I was talking to a colleague of mine yesterday. I'm working on a show right now that's very sort of Monty Python. So it's very sort of tongue in cheek gag sound effects. And it's like, it's interesting because we're, we're as sound designers, we're so um, prepared to make things fit into a world that we forget that our job is to some sometimes be the sore thumb, like the sore thumb sound effects that have to play as a sound effect because that's the funny part of it. And the genre dictates that and the style and aesthetic di dictates that. But, you know, it's interesting for me to work on something. And it's the first time I've worked on something like this, that this, of this style. So it really takes me out of my comfort zone where I normally spend so much energy making sure that spaceship is that spaceship and you believe that or that door is that door, even though they that, that isn't that door, it's something I've composed into that door but we're so conditioned to make things fit that so much there's is a part of our job where it's like no 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 now it's your your time to match this aesthetic which is make that sound effect funny you want we want people to pay attention to that sound effect so it's interesting it's it's so you don't realize that at first, but as you work and work, you realize a lot of the job is adapting. It, it's being able to just be fluid between shows and, and genres as well, right? And, and I know um, this, this um, discussion we're having today was sort of focused on horror, and which is great because even within horror, there's suspense, there's classic horror, there's the slasher horror, there's the psychological thriller. And even within certain genres, there might, might, might be like 10 branches of styles that go into that, that we have to adapt to, um, which I think is really interesting. I always look at Dev and Kristen and I, I totally applaud them for being able to maneuver between those genres as well. Yeah, that's pretty, I, I you answered that so well, because it's, it's, yeah, you really do have to kind of pivot sometimes. Um, but Kristen, um, on a, a big show like uh, The Mandalorian, I'm sure that even though there's like these deadlines and it's a lot faster, obviously you like for each show, like a series or, or that sort of thing, you create a shorthand for like visual effects. And I'm sure that, um, do you ever like re reuse, I guess, um, mapping and that sort of thing from show to show or because there's like I guess some set techniques and set programs and that sort of thing so do you have to change it from show to show I was just curious about that yeah yeah it really yeah it's it's funny that you mentioned um like comedy we it's really like a stylistic choices on each show are so different and it's so interesting to like pivot from one to the other like I've worked on black comedy kind of shows where like again the animation is supposed to be like kind of slapsticky kind of funny and then something like the Mandalorian where it's like everything is supposed to be very realistic and fit into the the like set world of Star Wars so like there's obviously like years worth of of um looks that they're trying to fit into and like backstory that they want to like keep the canon um the for the Mandalorian I think um we reuse a lot of like techniques from show to show. Like we figured out like ways to make things quicker or more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like things to make uh, the effects that we need to do easier or like setups that we can reuse. Um, but each show does have its own kind of like visual language. So everything, there's not very much that we can like take from in one show and use exactly the same way on another. It's always like a lot of development per show. Okay, because also there's different directors, correct? Uh, for each yeah, exactly. episode, right? Yeah, so they'll want to go a different way. Yeah, okay. So Got it. Like okay. Mandalorian, we can use stuff from episode to episode, but it's also like its own visual language, which right. is on other shows. Okay. 
that's so fascinating to me. I just, I'm like, oh, does that, that make, does that make it easier? So that's really fascinating. Oh, I love that. <laughs> cool. All right. So um, let me think if there's got, I've got any other questions. So do you actually have any questions for each other? <laughs> just curious, like, cause I know that um, Dev, uh, Dev and Dash, you guys work together. So, but um, I don't know, does anybody have any questions for each other? Cause I, I know that you have, you kind of all know how you work together, but yeah. Uh, this is not a question, it's more like a comment, but I think it's so fascinating for like Dash's work because we generally only ever see edits with temp sound um, and it totally completely changes the feel of everything to finally see it with, with final sound. <laughs> it's like completely different experience than watching the edit beforehand. Yeah. And, and, you know, in my experience, I never get the chance to talk to Kristen in the process because, uh, you know, I'm always naturally, I think for efficiency sake, and it only makes sense that I see visual effects through devs picture cut, because if I were to go to the source, there's so there's so much we're working on parallel to each other and things are evolving and changing. So it doesn't make sense for me to to go to a VFX uh, producer and be like, hey, can I grab things from this evolving state? I would rather grab it from when they give it to dev because then there's some sort of um, so whatever, whether it's the motion in it, whether it's the size and weight of something, there's something solid in it for me to start to link things to. And that's normally how I work with visual effects is I'll wait for it to show up in the cut and then I'll start to even just piecemeal throw stuff at it. I'll never really flesh it out until I see that it's in a state where the motion is there, everything's feeling a little more natural. But, you know, like I said, it, it, I love being on a panel with Kristen because I, I don't really get the opportunity to reach out to VFX too much. That's awesome. And Dev, do you have any, any comments? Well, you know, it's interesting because I'm kind of in the middle of these two people. So I, again, sort of flipping back to that uh, collaboration and communication, uh, you know, I think that part's the most fun, you know, it's, it is, it's having this conversation with visual effects, it's putting it in the cut, uh, sort of dealing with the story and the character of that piece, that section, then getting a chance to, like Kristen said, send it off to Dash. I'll put some stuff in there, but then it'll start having a different weight and a different feel when it gets sent to sound designers like Dash and, and sound dogs. And even dialogue, like cleaning it up. I mean, I do so much myself now because you know I have so many friends that are sound people that I start borrowing things. I'll go out and record stuff myself now, you know, cause I'm kind of interested in that. What does that sound like? What does that feel like? I'll watch films um, and and listen to the sound. Uh, I'll, I'll look at, I have, you know, friends in visual effects that tell me about virtual production. And I start thinking, okay, look at what you could do with all this stuff. And, and that part, I'm in a privileged spot, I think, because I get to see both. Um, but I think what, what everybody's gaining from this is when there's time and that everybody gets a chance to communicate, it gets just closer to the, to servicing the vision of the director. Cause that's what we're all here for. We're all sort of servicing that idea, the story and, and, and the, the film or show. And I, and I always just like talking to everybody. So I get into that part. I learn so much, you know, so that's a blast. That's awesome. And um, are there any innovations, like a new tech that has really caught your eye um, in the last year or so? Because I would imagine things have to be, you kind of have to work on the fly now that there are restrictions, I guess, in terms of, of creating a film or a show because people can't actually come together, although that's changing a little bit. But um, Kristen, you talked about the, um, the new tech that you were using, anything else? Yeah, the virtual production stuff is, is really exciting for, for us. It gives us an opportunity to be involved in production earlier and also to like 
make sure that our vision aligns with art departments more fully, which is really exciting. And it's, um, it's very cool to be on set and get to talk to the directors one-on-one -on -one more often. Um, that's like something that we don't have as much time to do in traditional visual effects. Um, and also just to be involved with production design from the very beginning, we get like more autonomy, I think in virtual production, they give us like concepts and whatnot, but we get to pick a lot of the detail work ourselves in order to fit with, with the overall vision, which is really very fun and exciting rather than just being able to see what was shot and try to fit within that, we get to kind of dictate from the beginning how everything is going to look. It's really exciting. That's great. Um, Dash? Oh, yeah. It, you know, the one thing I was most impressed about when COVID hit was in, in our film industry was how fast we were able to keep things going, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, for a lot of reasons was great. Um, but with ADR and dealing with um, actors and getting lines, we thought initially it became such a sort of scary mm -hmm. point because a lot of that stuff still needed to get done for a show to be completed and you know software came out and I'm trying to remember the name of it and I can't because I really want to plug it um, but being a sound effects editor I, I, I'm not using it all the time but it was great it, it allowed an actor to basically download software even onto their iPad we would send them a microphone in a kit with everything they needed just ship through you know any delivery company they would get it the next day all they would have to do is find a quiet place in the corner of their closet or something um they would have the picture that's uploaded to the software it's the exact clip of the line they need they would attach the microphone to their ipad um and it was it, the microphone itself was was quality enough that it was going to work in the show it, it actually sounded really great the hardest part was for them to just find a quiet spot that wasn't you know you're hoping it's not a bathroom because then you get that sort of bathroom and you can't really use that for outside stuff so as long as they found like a quiet spot we were still able to get adr lines coming through and we were able to finish shows and i was so impressed that that software came through you know months into our uh our our shows so it's great. so great. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay. okay. Oh, I've got a question. Okay. So I think we've opened it up to questions from the audience and we've got one. Um, can each of you comment on the autonomy that directors and assistant directors allow for your roles? So you want to start, Dev? Okay. Uh, and allow for, I, you know, it's an interesting question. Autonomy. Um, I I feel like as an editor, you have a great deal of autonomy, but but your but the nature of it is is you're in service of the story. So I think directors, um, when you haven't met a director or an assistant uh, director before, uh, there's a trust building stage, uh, and that that can go on for a fair bit. Uh, your goal, obviously, as an editor is to try and uh, close that gap and get that trust as fast as possible. So, uh, and the more trust you have, the more autonomy you have, because then they trust, you know, different things. And, and what I like to do, at least in the assembly, is uh, try a few different ideas. You know, the director kind of knows what they want uh in a lot of cases and a lot of sort of set pieces and things but sometimes you might play with it a little bit and change it like one of the nice things that you get sometimes from a director is is like you know i would have never cut that scene like that but that's really good you know and and those things where you can surprise somebody with some ideas make some changes to it a little early you always have variations and and i think that that's what's a lot of fun in editing and what what you can what you gain by being an editor with a director is that uh your goal is to give them something different something new something that they can't they don't guess so to it could be tonally it could be like how you how you set a scene how you pace a scene uh what takes you use uh and and the more they kind of feel comfortable with that the more you show them things the more interested they are into into letting you go and another thing that's great about editing is I can take risks. Like 
I don't have the weight of the the show or film on me. So I can go far out and sort of push the boundaries of something and show outside of what the contained story is and, and different perspectives and ideas. And and then the the director can sort of shape where I go. And I I like that part. I like being like pushing the boundaries of what the genre is or what the style is or what the story is and seeing what we can do because that that stuff ends up being more memorable and it's and it's riskier and 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 that's the fun of of creating and being a part of the creative process is is you know don't be safe like take chances that's awesome and um what about dash do you have any Oh, yeah, I, I think De Dev nailed it. I think, you know, again, it's one of those things that across the board between the three of us, we all go through. It's, 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 yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're sort of servicing the show and we're servicing a vision. But that vision is, is I sort of picture it as like, just like an atmosphere of ideas that can meet that, meet that goal or that vision. And it's our job. That's where the autonomy comes in is like, you know, you give you give the same scene to three different sound designers, they're kind of come up with three different things, even though they're trying to achieve the same goal. And I think that's where the autonomy comes in is that my idea is no better or worse than the next designer's idea. It's just different. And like Dev was saying, like the coolest part about the job is being able to throw something out there that's so left field, because sometimes when you do that, it might be wrong in a sense, but you can't be afraid of that either. That's part of the process. Sometimes going far left means you get to the answer or you might surprisingly provide some sort of different perspective on which way something can go. So, you know, as designers, as pitch editors, as visual effects supervisors, we all have to take those risks. And, you know, the I always say the one note that used to scare me when I started cutting was when somebody, when a director or a showrunner was too general with their, and I, I'd always look for specifics to latch onto. Now I love it because then I see that as, yeah, let me go play. Let me go try to impress you as much as possible sort of thing, yeah. Same for you, Kristen. Is that around the general? Yeah, yeah. I was going to say something really similar. Actually, it depends. It depends a lot on the director. Sometimes people come in, especially if you're working on like a second or third season. People come in with like a very specific vision of exactly what they want. It's been done before, and we're just matching that. And sometimes it's like the only note will be like, "Give us something we've never seen before," and then we have to do something interesting and show it and see if that's what they're looking for, or if not. A lot of times we'll provide a lot of different options, like different looks. And then even if none of them are really what they're looking for, it usually can start a conversation about, about what we what we should aim for, which is kind of great. That's great. Okay. Um, so another question, is there a technique specific to horror that you've learned um, from early on that you still use in your present work? Um, anyone, uh, Dash or Dash or? Oh, like uh, Kristen can go ahead on this one. Okay, Kristen, do you? I haven't actually worked on a lot of horror. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> or is there something like early on that you kind of still use, like from your early days? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. A lot of like, a lot of techniques and and tricks that we we pick up, we'll just keep using on every show that we work on, which is which is cool. We um, you know, every every show provides new knowledge and new experiences and we, we keep folding that in as we go along. Okay, great. Um, yeah, um, I, I, I'd say that, um, you know, it might not be answering the question like exactly, but um, specific to horror, I found that it's about creating space sonically. It's, it's about really being selective. Um, you know, you take a scene that's like a, a character walking through a house, you know, at night and it's dark and there's a murderer somewhere in the house. There's, you know, a handful of ways you can play that. You could hear the wind whistling through the window. You could hear their feet against the hardwood floor. You could hear the creaks of the house settling. You could hear, you know, some shuffling where, you know, the sort of misdirection sort of style of things do you want music maybe you don't want music at all maybe maybe all you want is just ominous design that plays maybe it's it's completely music driven and so when i 
you know, in the handful of horror things I have worked on, I've realized it's about being selective, but it's also showing up with each one of those sonic elements in a way that they can play on their own. So being very selective, but making sure each one of those things can play on their own, because like I was saying, when you're trying to build suspense, it's about um, uh, taking elements away. It's about removing a lot of stuff and choosing the things that are really going to give you that sense of discomfort or, you know, unease and, you know, being very selective. That's what I've learned. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, um, Actually, this is kind of this would kind of piggyback onto what Dash says. Um, there's another question. What are some noteworthy examples of great horror or action editing, sound design, uh, VFX? So maybe Dev, you could um, kind of start this answer. Uh, that's a good one. Um, I'm going to use two examples, but they're just like things that I've been recently and and i watched a long time ago and sometimes watch again so uh one that uh i was sort of deconstructing a little bit uh was uh the shining so the shining is is really interesting when you when you watch it because it's sort of it all takes most of it takes place in the overlook and uh it's a very uh drawn out pace um and what's really interesting about it is probably music editing, because uh, they're all found pieces, and uh, you know, and some of the sound design. When you're when you're with the kid, you know, on this on a on a tracking shot around the the hotel, you know, you're hearing these sounds like, but it's not all four wheels of that thing. It's just two. It's like the first two, the last two. And then the music starts to come up and it's like, it could be Ligeti or something. It's sort of that mid-century uh, uh, composition, atonal stuff. And, uh, and those sounds together kind of form the edit and that the edit is actually quite quiet. There's a lot of these long shots. Another one is, uh, and this is, you know, interestingly enough, another one that's, that's, that has uh, less cuts in it that I watched recently is a movie called the killing of two lovers which is a, a fairly it's shot in 12 days uh beautifully shot the sound is incredible it's all music concrete uh and and what it does it's a drama you know but like a lot of dramas right now there's what's interesting about horror is horror can fit in anywhere so a lot of interesting movies uh there will be blood has a horror soundtrack actually horror sound uh and it builds a lot of tension but it's a period drama you know uh and so i think horror fits into a lot of spaces in really intriguing ways in tempo and timing and what's great about editing horror is that you your your power is time and that's pretty much in every everything but but what you can do is really extend time make it slower than real life because that's what it feels like to be afraid things slow down and so you can kind of get that feeling across and and you can pace it up like sometimes things happen so fast you can sort of you can go from these long extended stretches to real fast action and that that idea how you can play with that is it surprises people and, and and that's usually a an advantage of horror and and a style of horror um there's there's so many dimension of you know, great editing mm -hmm. films that are edited well. So, but those are two that I like. Recently. That's that's a great answer. Um, okay, we have to have. Uh, we're down to our last question. So, um, there are more computers options, and it's all faster. Have you lost anything in the increased speed of post production? Lost. Yeah, have you lost anything because everything's so much faster now with computers? Do you feel like you've lost anything or is it better or? Oh, uh, yeah, no, I don't feel like I've lost any. I know there's a lot like, you know, there, in the sound world, like there are plugins and things coming out every day. They're super expensive. So again, like you become really selective of what you choose. But no, I don't feel like I've lost anything. I'm, I'm, I 
consider myself more of a minimalist when I cut. And if I do grab onto some, a new tool or new technology or something, I talk to a handful of my colleague designers around me to make to, to just gauge like, is would you use something like this? Is this worth me being the guinea pig for, you know? But I, I certainly don't you, grab everything cool that I see coming out. And I'm sure they're all great and they all have a purpose. It's, you know you can get lost in that. And I think the only place you do, you do lose out is when you start to focus on the, 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 the technical side of stuff and you forget that you're a crafts per person, right? You're, you're here, you're, you're creative and you, your job is to create subjective material and, and you're an artist. So it is easy to get lost in that. And I think maybe because of that, I'm, um, I sway away from it a little bit. And, and I, kind of stay focused on what I'm creating you know if somebody tells if somebody sees what I'm doing and what I'm creating and goes hey all those five steps you took you know you can do it in two if you just use this and come to the same answer a hundred percent I'm on board but yeah that's awesome and Kristen do you have anything to add yeah I think the only thing that I would say has is sometimes lost when when shows run with a very tight pre-production or post-production schedule is that occasionally we don't get to implement all the things that we would like to implement like we have cool ideas of like how the shot could be better or or little tiny details that might make it like sing more and we don't have time to to add them because we just like only have a few weeks to get the shot out um so the longer that we get in visual effects the more the more time we have to make everything really fit together and look really good and I was going to mention something real quick about the the horror was that I feel like a lot of like Dash and my work is like almost subconscious, like tiny details that you don't even notice until you've watched something a couple of times. Um, sound details that you can almost not really even hear or like visual details that are that are so so small you don't see them the first time, but that really adds, I think, to the to the immersion of watching it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and Dev, I think you've got the last <laughs> word. <laughs> um, it's funny. I don't think it makes anything any faster. The technology. I think you. I think it makes it. You think you can do more iterations. Like the, the tools are always in service of you. I remember when I first started, and I think I rented my gear. Uh, and it was when I was an assistant and my gear cost more than I did. And I was like, that is wrong. You know, I'm worth more than the tool that I have. I'm worth more than the hammer. So I think that, you know, it does, it's, it's a tool that you use to tell a better story. And ultimately I don't know that it makes it any faster or anything. I think people think that it does, but it doesn't. It just means that you can go through more iterations. And and that's a that's a privilege and and because it's a little bit more efficient that way you can you can test more ideas out, uh, and that of course is a double edged sword. Yeah. You know? So <laughs> <laughs> more ideas isn't always better, but well, but it's good. Uh, this was wonderful. I thank you all so much for your insight. Um, and I'm just gonna throw to Katie again. Um, from uh, the Members Lounge. And again, thank you so, so much for your wonderful answers and your insights. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's yeah, great. Thank you. Yes, hello. Um, I wanted to echo those thank yous. Uh, thank you so much to Dash, Dev, Kristen, and Carolyn for today's conversation. Um, that was really, really great to listen to. Thank you for kicking off the Members Lounge 2022 with us. Um, and another thank you as well to our partners at the Directors Guild of Canada in Ontario for presenting today's session. Mm -hmm.